In this video, we're going to continue our comparison of Python lists and Java arrays. In the previous video, we looked at these two code fragments and compared them. The Python one works with a list of integers that represents a set of temperature values. The Java equivalent works with an array of integers. In Python, lists have operators for slicing to get a sublist, for concatenating one list onto another, for getting repeated copies of values into one big list. Unfortunately, Java arrays do not have those operators. They're much more bare-boned. If we want to get some of that same functionality, we could in theory use static methods that are in the built-in arrays class that we discussed in the previous video. So for example, arrays.copyOfRange allows us to do slicing. But the more common thing would be to use one of the built-in collection classes for lists that come with Java. We can use one of those collection classes instead of an array if we really need a lot of this special functionality. Objects of these classes have non-static methods, methods that are inside the object that we can use for list operations. And we will soon be building our own collection classes in Java. So let's go back to this list of temperatures again. And let's assume that instead of having fixed temperatures, we want to get the temperatures from the user. So first we need to create space for the values that the user is going to give us. And let's assume we just want four temperatures instead of five. So in Python, one way to do that would be to say, take a list with only one zero, multiply it four times, and that will give us a list of length four that is filled with zeros. The corresponding Java code looks like this, and because I want to emphasize the key components, I've got the general pattern down here in blue. So we begin with the keyword new. We always need to use that new operator when we're constructing a new object, and that's what we're doing here. Then we have the type of the elements, and that's the same type that we used over here when we declared the variable. And then in brackets, we put the length that we want. So we're saying, I want an array of length 4 that is able to hold integers. So here are some other examples. Here I'm creating an array that has room for 100 doubles. Doubles are, remember, floating point values. Here I'm creating an array that has room for 10 strings. And when you first create the array, the elements are going to be the default value of their type. So for numeric types, the default value is 0. So up here we're going to get an array of four zeros at the beginning. For booleans, it's false is the, is the default value. And for any object type, the special value null is what is used. So here, for example, I'm going to start out with an array filled with 10 nulls. OK, so once we have our array constructed, how do we fill it? So we're going to print the prompt, just like we would in Python, so the user knows what we want. And then in this case, because there's only four values, we could, in theory, do four separate inputs. So in Python, we use the input function. In Java, we use the nextint method in a scanner object. And I'm assuming I've already created that scanner object, as we've seen before. And then for every value the user gives me, I'm storing it in one of the positions in the array. So the first value goes in position 0, second value in position 1, etc. And then we will do something with the array, like printing it. And we saw how to print arrays in Java in the last video. OK, now, what if instead of having four things that we want, we instead want 100? Right? So we have to change our prompt, obviously. And the user is probably not going to be very happy with us to have to enter 100 values. But the more problematic thing here is we don't want to have to do 100 lines in which we call the appropriate function or method and assign. And so instead, we're going to use a loop, an index-based loop. And we've seen these in Python in the past. So here's what the Python loop looks like. Here's the corresponding Java for loop. And in both cases, the loop variable i is being used as an index. So here we're saying we want i to go from 0 up to but not including 100. And for each value of i, we're going to call nextint using the scanner. And we're going to take what the user gives us and store it in position i of the array. So when i is 0, we'll store something in position 0. When i is 1, we'll store something in position 1. And that will allow us to gradually add values to the array 
until all 100 values are added. Now this is an example of a more general thing, and typically when we're doing an index-based loop that processes an array, rather than hard coding the length of the array or of the list over here for Python, it's better to actually get the length. So here we would do len temps if it's Python. For Java, we would do temps.length. And that's going to make it more flexible. If we end up changing things so that it's not 100, we won't have to change the loop. The loop will adapt. Okay, so these loops, these index-based loops, are part of a more general pattern. We use index-based loops to process sequences all the time. And so here's the more general pattern in Java. i starts at 0 i is less than the length of the array, i++, plus plus, and then in the body of the loop we do something with element i of the array. We can also do element-based loops. We saw this in Python, right? Here's what it looks like in Python. And the corresponding Java element-based loop looks like this. So we still begin with the keyword for, we still declare our loop variable, but we don't initialize it. Instead we have a colon, and then we have our array variable. And that's going to do the same thing that for val in list does in Python. The loop variable val is going to get one value at a time, one element at a time, from the array. And then inside the loop, we'll do something with that element. 